So as you can imagine, I am not uh, Philip Usher, but I'll speak uh, for him. Um, well, he probably doesn't need any introduction because he's the great mind uh, behind this conference, but I I'll still try. So Philippe Usher is Associate Professor of French Literature, Thought and Culture and of Comparative Literature at New York University. He has written extensively on the conceptual histories of geography in early modern France, including the book Errance et Cohérence, published by Classic Garnier in 2010, and L'Aide et le Géographe, published by Classic Garnier in 2018. His current research uh, increasingly engages with ecological thought, bridging the gap between uh, the modern period and the contemporary. Such a project has been carried in his thought-provoking piece published in Diacritics in 2016, Untranslating the Anthropocene. In this piece, Philippe Usher explores the contrasted histories of the words anthropos in Greek and homo in Latin, opening the possibility to reconcile a too often oversimplified humanism and the question of the Anthropocene. He calls these projects the humanist Anthropocene. His next book, uh, Exterranean, Ecologies of Extraction in the Humanist Anthropocene, will be out next year at Fordham University Press. Hello, I'm going to read this text at the first person. Um, good afternoon. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. Um, this afternoon, I would like to share with you some recent work that is part of a book. Um, that will be out in uh, next March from Fordham, uh, thanks to Tom Lay. I would like to expand on just one part of that project to hone in on our topic of French natures. Before I start, allow me to acknowledge that the fabulous image of mining moles here is from a play titled uh, La Nuit des Taupes, The Night of the Moles, by Philippe Quen a playwright who is also the direct a, a playwriter who is also the director of the Théâtre des Amantiers in Nanterre. It is a powerful riot of a play in which moles dig, dig, mourn, have sex, and play the termine. It's like getting a very satisfying injection of materialist philosophy cut with something vaguely psychotropic. Put it in your calendars. Uh, the play will be here at NYU Skirball Theater in fall 2019. And we'll be having some related events here at the Maison, so please come back. Back to my project. The title is Ex Exterranean Ecologies of Extraction in the Humanist Anthropocene. And as I said, I want to build on just one part of that here today. First of all, for about the first five minutes, it is useful that I define a few things, starting with the word that is the title of the book, and today talk, that is to say, exterranean, a term that aims at recasting some physical realities in a new way. What interests me is that is thinking about the extraction of stuff from the earth, a process in which matter goes from being sub to exterranean, from being underground to being cut from the ground. In these terms, the gold in the ring on my finger and the rare earth metals in my MacBook and cell phone were once subterranean, they are now ex-Tyrrhenian. The Latin roots here are not those of the adjective exterraneus, which refers to things that come from abroad, another land, but rather a host of expressions in both classical and post-classical texts that talk about taking things ex terra. The driving conviction behind such an innovation is that if we have stumbled into the Anthropocene, it is not only because we emit, but first and foremost because we extract. Much of the carbon dioxide that now fills our atmosphere, currently at a concentration of about 400 parts per million, was released by the combustion of stuff, coal, coal oil, gas, that used to be materially connected to the earth. Now everyone knows this clearly, but we do not always feel or remember it, which has huge political consequences. The document known as the Paris Agreement produced within the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, COP21, in December 2015, is 31 pages long. It uses the word emission, emittere, to put out, a total of 19 eight times. 
Words such as extraction and mining appear not at all, as if that which we burn had no origin. This document, well-meaning, is also, when read closely, an exercise in disconnection. What happens, I have been wondering, if we make the conceptual choice to re-inscribe extraction into the story? Such a reinscription requires, so that we really see it and think with it, a new word, exterranean, which uh, responds to the need to grasp at, at the same time, all of the following. The land, ground, place where extraction occurs, terra with a small t, the planet to which this land, ground, place belongs, terra, telus, the action of moving matter away from the land, ground, place, planet, x, and that matter itself, which removed becomes and always will be, can nev ver never not be exterranean. In opposition to this word, the terms mining and extraction create a cut and make that cut invisible. To mine, uh, which comes from the, uh, the uh, in French, miner, to dig under land, a rock, so as to make it collapse, uh, which also is related to undermine, captures the moment of collapse. Mines are etymologically places for disintegration. To extract from the Latin extraere, ex out, traere to draw, and emphasizes the action of removal. Both terms, to mine and to extract, perform a rupture. The ground, hillside, or planet becomes raw material, product, such that with what is one moment merely a part of the Ronda Valley is transformed materially and ontologically into coal. In other words, the words to mine and to extract make us forget where that coal comes from, which is perhaps why the COP21 document don't even use them, for they hand over lexical power to easily to lexical power to easily to emission. To talk of the ex Terranian allows us to think, feel, material continuities and to take into hermeneutic custody all of the human and non-human agents and materials of the process. This is theoretically an important move, for it privileges neither the miner, nor the pick axe, nor the valley, nor the fire dump, nor the gold, nor the ring wearer. It is not possible when we nominalize the adjective to point to, to localize the ex -terranian, just as we can see a film, but not the filmic. Assessing the exterranean thus requires multiple entry points. In the wider project and today, I approach and develop the notion of the exterranean from what might appear at first to be an oblique perspective by engineering collisions between the reality and theory of our present moment and text and images from early modern Europe a collision laboratory that I refer to as the humanist anthropocene. I shall thus be putting, because of their differences and différents, the anthropos of the anthropocene in dialogue with the homo of early modern humanism, a dialogue that aims to respond to Dipesh Chagraparty, central insight, however anthropogenic the situation of the anthropocene may be, there is no corresponding humanity that is that in its oneness can act as a political ad agent. There will be a lot more to unpack at this point, as a sandbox called the humanist Anthropocene clearly flies in the face of much recent work on post-humanism. <laughs> I can go into this in a more detail in a Q&A. Um, actually, I'm not going to do that. Uh, <laughs> but for now, let me just state three things. One. Humanism is not, historically speaking, a synonym of anthropocentrism, as Kenneth Gowens has shown, Kerry Wolf's constru constru construction of posthumanism is built from the ground up on a misreading of key humanist texts. Second, humanism's homo is not my savior. What interests me is its subjectness that is constituted by an analytic continuity that gets largely erased in mon modernity. Third, texts and images from early modern Europe present themselves as particularly attuned to the exterranean in part because 
It is at this moment that extractive industries develop at unprecedented scales, and it is in this first century of print that we witness the publication of the first text, not about underground materials, but about mining processes, especially, of course, Georgius Agricola. So, with this general framework in mind, the need to focus on extraction, the proposal to administer a neologism, exter exterranean, and the dialogue between homo and anthropos, I thus turn to a specific set of French texts, images, and contexts. Let us head to the town of Caen in Normandie in order to ask some questions about the extraction of one particular matter, limestone. Now, this section is called crocodiles. We, we must first acknowledge some chronological crossroads. On the one hand, we who live after the invention of modern geological sciences can articulate with scientific bravado as follows. Caen, history is rock bound because about uh, 165 million years ago, long before Normandy was synonymous with apple trees and cider, it was home to mangroves and crocodiles. We can say that warm seas used to wash limestone. Uh, lime is that yeah? Okay. We can see that warm seas used to wash limestone-rich mud onto the shores, which slowly deposited matter that would eventually be extracted, beginning in antiquity, from mines and in and around Caen in the form of a creamy yellow limestone. We can say that Caen uh, geology, its rich Hultic veins, determined by the town's architectural landscape, its particular yellow-white color, and beyond a fair chunk of European history. We can assert this connection between deep time, geology, and human-scale history, between mangroves and quarries, and between the Jurassic and the early modern, because in 1817, a fossilized crocodile skeleton was discovered in a block of recently mined Caen stone. The inhabitants of 16th century Caen, including celebrated poets Jean Marot, Jean Vauclin de La Frenay, and François de Malherbe, for their part clearly had no idea that Normandy was once tropical, nor that the rest of what would become France had once been underwater. The argument in what follows is distinctly not that any 16th century Norman knew of deep time and geology or about crocodiles and mangroves. It is rather a first that early modern Caen's limestone scape made Caen a petroglyph whose durability inhabitants longed for, but also worried about. And second, that at least one Caené humanist, on whom more soon, already intuited that the earth itself and matters extracted from it function as recording media, and indeed a particular fragile one. Beforest map. A map from François de Belforest, late 16th century cosmographie universelle, is a good place to start. It captures and displays in multiple ways a keen cognizance of the fact that the town is the result of Normandy rock going from below to above ground, as if Caen were created by turning Normandy's surface depth in upside down. The map depicts choreographically numerous buildings made of stone extracted locally, generally from underground galleries, galleries within city limits where veins were frequently 90 to 100 feet thick. Prominent are the huge limestone walls and towers of the castle built by William the Conqueror um, around uh, 1016, one of the largest castles in Western Europe which still dominate the town today. Among many other visible structures, are the Église Saint-Pierre de Caen, opposite the castle, the Abbey of Homme and the Abbey of Dame. And we see buildings made of local stone, not just human-made structures, but if we simplify our gaze, objects made of extracted matter that sit on the planet's surface, both off it and on it. The map goes beyond choreography, however. It also specifically draws our attention to the fact that Caen is its own site of extraction. The legend on the left-hand side of the map identifies Caen Castle as follows. The castle seated upon stone quarries. 
the château assis sur carrière, an inscription that foregrounds and as if replays the vertical shift of stone from below ground to surface level that constituted the castle, an intuition also graspable by modern visitors to the castle who can see exposed, yet not extracted, stone in a moat wall directly opposite the castle itself. Similarly, item number 25 in the legend points to the fact that Caen was not just made of stone, not just a site of stone extraction, but a site for the commercial exchange of stone. The beautiful cross, which marks the limestone and time market, La Belle Croix et Marché à la Chaux et Tuile. Normandy limestone had, of course, been extracted for a long time for the construction of William's castle for export to medieval England and so forth. Between 1500 and 1560, something interesting happens, however, that forces a reckoning of human and geological timelines that causes a new awareness of local extraction. Namely, the arrival of humanist Italianate architecture and its demands for even bigger and even more faultless blocks of limestone, the supply of which became more and more difficult. There is thus the Hôtel de Ton, built for Thomas Morel. Uh, finished around uh, 1527, whose Gothic asymmetrical facade and heavy square tower stand in aesthetic opposition to the medallion, nodes to triumphal architecture, the foliage friezes and putti a mixture of moments and size akin to that which Henri Zener sees on the facade of the Cathedral de Rodez. Also emblematic of this moment is the Hôtel de Nolan, also known as the Manoir des Gendarmes, built by Gérard de Nolan at the beginning of the reign of François I. Again, the somewhat Gothic structure is marked by the architectural trends of its moment of construction. For example, in a series of medallions that allude directly to the first French printed edition of Petrarch Triomphi. In other words, to phrase this somewhat colloquially, when a 16th century homeowner looked at his new hotel particulier, was he impressed by the factum, uh, by the Italianate architectural details, orders, loggia, sculptures, or by the fact that his block of local stone was bigger than his neighbors? This question is, I think, theoretically fundamental, for it forces us to ask, do we see the stone and geology, or do we see the human roped details, which retains our attention? In other words, if we look at the third triumph, engraved on Normandy limestone at the Hotel de Nolan, we can tell the story in purely human history terms, in terms of flows, uh, flows of artistic ideas, books and motifs from Italy to France. But when we look on at the medallion, we should also remember that we are looking, after all, at a piece of sedimentary rock composed largely of calcium carbonate. Seeing both the limestone and the Petrarchan factum at the same time, a critical intervention puts us precisely at the theoretical vantage point offered by the Anthropocene, which involves a redistribution of the natural and the social slash the symbolic. In our present moment, this redistribution is exempl exemplified by the appearance of a new kind of stone, the plastic glomerate, which is an indurated multi-composite material made hard by agglutination of rock and molten plastic. Such stones are particularly common on the beaches of Hawaii, most well known in his Camilo Beach on the southwest coast. As Bruno Latour has put it, with such a stone, it becomes quite simply impossible to, I quote, distinguish the partagé, man from nature, end of quote. Only seeing the, tri the triumph on the limestone and not the limestone, as the founders of Renaissance studies would have wished, both Bucart and Michelet, so the Renaissance, as the moment man is separated from nature, we see only the human imprint, not the human entanglement with stone. I am suggesting that because of the upturn in extraction and building in early modern camp, 
there was a Bell Forest map seems to suggest an awareness for the stoniness of the city that might have allowed onlookers of the Hotel de Nolan, for example, to see not just Petrarch, but also limestone, and perhaps not just as a medieval moat, but also that moat as a quarry. This is for sure part of speculation here, which is why I now turn to a 16th century writer from Caen who can, I think, allows, allow us access to his sense of the town as geomedium. Charles de Bourgueville. Charles de Bourgueville is not a household name today, not in France, not even in Normandy. He's the author of two books that concern me here, The Recherche et Antiquité de la Province de Notry and subsequent Recherche et Antiquité de la Ville et Université de Caen et Lieux Circonvoisins. Um, they both show, uh, him, uh, he shows himself to be not just a regional historian, trained in the methods of his time, but also a thinker of both lithic durability and, when put under a human hammer, lithic impermanency. Much more than those of other Cornet writers of the, peri of the period, Bourgueville writings place great emphasis on Caron architecture, on its stony materiality, and on its own very particular, almost cannibalistic externality. A first indication of this is that they contain numerous passages about the town's beauty and specifically about the stony nature of that beauty. Looking at Caen, one beholds, writes Bourgueville, one of the most beautiful, most spacious, most pleasing and delectable towns upon which one could hope to gaze. A general appreciation to which he adds the following key point, the town's magnificence is due to its situation, the structure of its walls, its churches, towers, pyramids, buildings, tall houses and buildings, and big and wide roads, all made of locally extracted stone. He instructs the would-be visitor that a good view of the town's building, in a slightly altered version of Homeric Theiscopia, is to be had from the city's bridges. Going beyond such petrophilia, Bourgueville makes no secret of the fact that the beauty of Caen's building, as he perceives it, is directly related to the rock matter of which they are made. His text gets quite specific. At one point, he notably describes the Saint-Julien neighborhood as a place where can be found quarries of the whitest, most polished, most gentle stone that one can find and which hardens when employed in construction. Superlatives thus impose themselves both for the town's beauty and the lithic matter of which it is made. Bourgueville goes on to state that the particular quality of Caen's stone is that neither time's abuse nor the force of the air or frost can harm it nor damage it, adding that the utility of these quarries and the beautiful stones are one of the reasons the town is so finely adorned and well supplied with beautifully and excellent buildings towers, pyramids, and other edifices. This is precisely the kind of alliance with endurance that Tiffany and Geoffrey Cohen have described so well. Although today the quarries of the Saint-Julien neighborhood are visible only in street signs, residents of early modern Caen would have, like Bourgueville, been able to appreciate more immediately the material genealogies of stone. The Saint-Julien neighborhood was, put a short, was but a short walk from the historic town center. But Bourgueville not only celebrates stone endurance, he worries about its frailty, especially in the light of events in uh, 1562. Bourgueville describes the worst of it as follows. On Friday night and all day Saturday, May 8 and May 9, all the temples, churches, and monasteries of this town were uh, pillaged and sacked. Windows and organs were broken, sacred images were massacred, and all the churches, the decoration that could be found were pillaged. Everything that was burnable was consumed by fire. Damages were estimated at more than 1,000 acres. Many houses and buildings were attacked or demolished, as were various statues around the town. His research and antiquité not only record the events of 1562, they also enact a variety of strategies for recovering 
or reproducing that which was stolen or destroyed. That is to say, for problematizing the too quick association of exterior and stone with durability. The book offers itself up as a site for the recovery for lithic loss in several ways. The text describes the exact size of certain demolished objects so as to keep a paper trace of the three-dimensionality of what once was made of local stone. Elsewhere, it registers the author's attempt to save destroyed stone monuments by creating new stone models. When a Protestant leader, the Duke of Bouillon, having taken over Caen's castle, feared that he might be attacked from the Collegial du Sepulcre, he ordered that the latter be destroyed, having no respect, writes Bourgueville, for the fact that he will be reducing to rubble such a beautiful temple and sacred place. Not content with merely registering the event, Bourgueville also reacts as follows. As they were getting ready to demolish this beautiful and ancient temple, I had a sketch or portrait made of it. Bourgueville's plan, however, was not merely to reproduce a paper sketch, but in due course to have that sketch sculpted in stone to be placed in the cemetery so that our children, descendants, and successors might be able to see it and experience the loss of the structure as I presented to them. Bourgueville phrasing catches our attention. The plan is specifically not just to have future generations remember the event of the Collegial's destruction, not even just to enable them to see or to imagine it, but very specifically to have them experience the loss to experience the loss of the very structure that is represented before them via a miniature stone reproduction. It is as if Bourgueville writes, look at this that you do not see. See the fragility of geomedia represented in this exterior reproduction. Another tactic for representing reproducing the stony parts of Caen destroyed by Protestants becomes apparent in the context of the destruction of the tombs of William the Conqueror and of his wife Matilda of Flanders. There, two singular and magnific magnificent sepulchres, as well as their effigies and lifelike representations made in 3D, according to their true appearance, were knocked down and demolished by the, these enraged hooligans, who had respect neither for the royal and ducal dignity of the disease, nor for the 500 years of antiquity of the objects themselves. To the destruction of these stones that took place within the Abbey aux Hommes et Abbey aux Dames that William the Conqueror and Queen Matilda founded, the Recherche et Antiquité offer a direct material response by reproducing the royal couple's epitaph to which Bourgueville adds his, his own French translation thereof. An example of the period's vogue of transforming stony epigraphy into the papyri and the portable, Bourgueville's quotation of the royal epitaph is also a rejoinder to the frangibleness of stone. Conclusion. There would be much more to say about geomedia in early modern Normandy, but already I hope to have given a sense of how in Renaissance Caen, human histories and lithic imaginaries were wholly interwoven in maps, in buildings, and in texts. Inhabitants of the town did not just live in the shadow of William the Conqueror's huge stone castle, like actors on a film set. It was their history and their present a reassuring continuity fashioned from stone extracted in or near the town. As Belfort's map and Bourgueville's text made clear, the relationship between stone quarry and stone building was visible, tangible, reapplicable, perhaps making the Italian details on the Hôtel de Nolan and the Hôtel d'Escoville not efface the material of which they are made. If it is now the tourist office, is it because as a site of reception for Italian architectural trends, or because it is made of local stone, or both. What is clear is that early modern Corne lived in dialogue with timeless and living entities much bigger than the human, even if there was not the discipline of geology to undergrid that move scientifically. They saw new buildings to be built, to be built in local stone, and all ones torn down in the context of religious and civil upheaval. 
The townhouse builders, the angry protestants, and the humanist-trained local historian already intuited in different ways that when human history interacts with stone, whose origins are literally rooted in the region's own grounds, that history requires, or rather just is a form of geomedia, resulting in an intimate, exterranean staining of the human. 